Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am excited to be here today with Joya Owens from the Friendship Society. And we're going to be talking about music and a lot of different aspects of the industry. Um, But before we get started, I'd love to have you tell us, Joya, just a little bit about your background in music, kind of your journey from where you started with music and where you are today and why you decided to start the Friendship Society to help musicians. Thank you so much. Well, first, let me say it's an honor to be talking here with you. And, you know, as I was telling you offline, I really love all the work that you are doing with the company and all the work you do in the community with uh, female songwriters. So I just wanted to say that before we had gotten started. But my name is Joya. Um, I've been introduced to the professional community as a singer songwriter. I was introduced to music, of course, like many other singers through church and um, then professionally through a gentleman by the name of Vincent Herbert that I met in the 90s. And um, I got signed as a major artist to what we now know as Universal Records. That was short lived. I enjoyed it. I went independent in the early 2000s and I just stayed independent. I've dabbled in probably uh, licensing and sync and probably I've had every deal. I always say that (laughs) known to man, (laughs) except for 360. And so in 2018, when I got signed to Cobalt, um, I took a little break from music for a while. And then I got signed to Cobalt in 2018. I decided that I would, uh, you know, take a step back in. And then I created the Friendship Society. And what that company basically does is We seek to educate musicians and independent artists, although we we work with um, executives and some some artists who are, I would consider, legacy legacy artists. But we we teach them about the fundamentals of the business. We know that they have funding problems and um, exposure problems and capital problems, and they're, they're really trying to figure out how to monetize their music. So we just teach them about brand building, revenue. We teach them about publishing, points, royalties, mechanicals, all of the things that they should be doing and just help them sort of build their business from a a position of of power and leverage where they can diversify later on. That's awesome. I'm just curious what you mean by legacy artists. Legacy artists would be artists that I consider them legacy because they've been in the business more than 15 years. So um, Got it. are these people that like maybe used to have a label and then they kind of had to go independent and they're needing to learn all this business stuff on their own? Correct. Yes. Yeah. I just um, actually just interviewed somebody who's been in the business. I mean, who's, he's a pianist, been in the business for 50 years or something like that. And he was talking about, you know, back in the old days when we did it this way and, you know, I made CDs and, you know, and he had to learn too, like, okay, how do I get this digitally distributed? And it was so worth his while because now he's making, you know, he's paying the bills from streaming because he had such a huge catalog, See? you know? Yes, yes, absolutely. And that's the dream client right there. You know, that's what you want to see because a lot of the young up and coming artists that I talk with, they have like 60 something odd thousand streams coming from Spotify, but they don't know, you know, maybe what a PRO is. Mm -hmm. And so you know that they don't know anything about mechanical royalties. So I'm just saying to myself, okay, so where's the payout coming from? And they're like, oh, TuneCore. I'm like, oh my goodness. (laughs) No, (laughs) yes, but no. So yeah. (laughs) Yes. No, that is so important because a lot of them think, well, I, you know, I just signed up with my distributor. They're handling everything. Correct. And I don't realize that, you know, there are other streams that are being missed or that maybe they're not getting as much of the percentage as they could have if they didn't do it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So do you feel like 
artists are still concerned about getting a record deal these days, or are they starting to see maybe the the benefits of being independent? I think both. I think they are concerned with getting a record deal. I think that most artists are like, no, I don't want to get signed. You know, I want to be independent. Then when you talk to them about just all of the groundwork that goes into, you know, creating your music, making your music, copywriting your music, protecting your music. Then they're like, well, you know, Joya, do you think it's bad, you know, to want a label? (laughs) So I'm like, no, I don't think it's bad, you know, Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I know that they do because when they find out that there's so much heavy lifting, it's like, mm, I might change my mind on that indie thing. Well, and there are alternatives, right? They can bring in other agents that can help them. They could get, you know, like a publishing agent or whatever to help them with a lot of that stuff. So they don't have to be signed, but that yet they don't have to do all the paperwork. Correct. Yeah, I think I think that's definitely a a possibility for those people that are in the middle. Now everybody knows, you know, the freedom of being independent and you see so many people being able to like go viral and start a career from TikTok and things like that. And that's the dream. Yeah. And so people see that and like, I I don't want a label. I don't want someone telling me what I have to do. But (laughs) then they don't see all the work that goes into that once you once you do get to that level. It's true. It's true. And then, you know, you'll you'll see things like maybe SZA on Twitter or some artists on Twitter saying, oh, my God, guys, my music is being held up. You know, the label won't release it or the label won't let me record or I don't know. Ask the label. I don't know when my next album is coming out. I have no you know, so it's like all of those things. So they're like, oh, my God, you know, it maybe it may not be all it's cracked up to be. So I think there's a 50-50 split. Some want to be signed, some want to be, some really want to be independent. Yeah, yeah, definitely. How do you think social media has played a role in this? Do you think that, I mean, I know, you know, there's a lot of things, especially on TikTok now, it's like, you know, do trends or, you know, do these, you know, covers and things like that. Do you think that that is taking over a little bit as far as like overcoming the original music just because people want to like have all those great social media numbers? I think yes, to a certain extent, of course, because I think that you may find, and it's not to say that artists on TikTok are not serious because I I know that they are hungry for it and they really want it. But I think sometimes that there is a thing where to get exposure is the get, not necessarily to get signed or have a professional career, but just to garner the attention and be able to hold that for a second, Mm -hmm. you know? So I would say that I absolutely do, but I think that it's changing because it seems as though artists want to be, they want to be educated. They really want to know, okay, beyond this, now what? Okay. You know, what do you think about NFTs? So What do you think about being signed? I've been approached, but they said my numbers on TikTok are good, but I have to get my streams up. I think social media has definitely changed it because you have more of an attention thing than you you really do um, artists who who are really focusing on the craft and the love of it. But it may not be such a a bad thing. I'm still in the middle. (laughs) on. Yeah, I know. It's hard because it's like, (laughs) like you said, they're expecting I mean, we talk about vanity metrics, but in some ways they're not just vanity because certain people that make decisions are looking at those numbers and it's important. But do you think it's it's eroding musicians ability to actually make good music because they're just thinking about what's the next trend or what's going to be popular on TikTok? You know, that's hard to say because we're seeing so many more musicians, right, based, you know, because we have social media, just able to see all of this traffic coming through. So it seems as though it seems as though we have to sift through, you know, to find the good ones. Whereas to before, you know, we would hear about artists when they got the label's attention. So I think it's hard to say, but I I would say that I think that we have enough musicians out there. We were just watching the award show the other day and we, and, you know, Taylor Swift comes on. I love, 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 love Taylor Swift. But then we have Taylor Swift. We have Billie Eilish. We have, you know, so many talented musicians. We have Lizzo. We have, you know, people that are out there that are making music for pop culture, but still we find that they have deep musicianship behind them. So I would have to say that I think that social media definitely makes it challenging. (laughs) (laughs) 
But, I, I, you know, music is love to me. I'm so very passionate about it. And I think it, you would have to really work hard to kill its essence. Mm. So. Yeah, that's good. I, I agree. I agree. But there are just a lot. There are a lot of musicians out there on TikTok. I think there's just <laughs> yeah. like TikTok somehow just like pulled everybody out from the woodwork that weren't on social media before. So it amazes <laughs> me when I, you know, look at some hashtags and there's like billions, you know, indie right. musician or something like that on TikTok or t- t- maybe musicians of TikTok or something is like a billion per people in that ha- or things wow. in the hashtag. Just, oh man, wow. where are these people coming from, you know? <laughs> Wow. 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 I guess people are like, well, here's my chance, you know? Yep. yep. If I never gave it a shot before, maybe, you know, maybe now I could, you know, so. That's right. And it's a lot easier than standing in, you know, hours and hours of lines to try out for American Idol where you might not, you know, you get 10 seconds to sing and they go, nope, you know, you can actually get on there and people will listen. I've been there before. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your heart's not pounding, um, you know, and you're not feeling like your heart's going to jump outside of your shirt. So, yeah, no. <laughs> mm. Oh, so you did. You tried out for one of those shows. I tried out for X Factor. Oh, um, X Factor. And I tried out for The Voice. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And was that a positive experience or? I would say it was a positive experience just because I had the opportunity to audition. I had a chance to meet some really cool people, people who had been there and they had done it for like six times or, Mm. you know, they had done all of them. They had tried out for all of them and they were, you know, we had to line up sort of like the night before. So the auditions would start that afternoon, but you needed to be in the line by 12 midnight the yeah. night before. Yeah. So how do you sing well when you've been up all night? That's my question. Oh man, <laughs> you know, and for the show, right. Because it is a show when all of the people are outside, they actually start taping before they let anyone in. Mm. Mm-hmm. So everybody's out there and they have like the drone and the helicopter and, you know, so it's, it's very taxing. So those, for those who do make it through, they really deserve it. Yeah. 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 It's impressive. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to totally switch gears on you right now. Cause I want to talk, you mentioned NFTs earlier and I want to talk about this because I had someone on a few months ago, just kind of explaining what NFTs are and you know, how they work, but I still feel like I can't get my mind around them just mm-hmm. because I feel like in the current state, they can actually be anything. So right. I'd love to hear your input on NFTs and what you think the future is for musicians. Absolutely. So I, I first heard, and I wish I could reach it because I, I, I actually tore the the the, uh, the article out. I, I remember when I first saw, saw the article, it was for uh, the artist Blau. And mm-hmm. It was saying how he released this album on NFT and the album was already two years old. And on NFT, it it had did like, I don't know, 10 million or something like that. And now he's the owner of the platform, Royale. So I think I'm still on the fence. I am intrigued, you know, to know, okay, we are now we're transitioning into another realm. Here we are, this is crypto, but, and, you know, it needs to be minted and then it needs to be this and it needs to be that. But my, my whole thing is this, I'm like, okay, so who is the audience? So who buys the NFT? So it's like, oh, collectors. Oh, okay. (laughs) So the NFT is basically like a Mona Lisa, Right. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's a piece of art. The, these are collectors that are collecting these non-fungible tokens, because if not, we, for instance, um, Nas was selling royalties. He was selling royalties as an NFT. So who would be interested in something like that, except for someone who has money and is a a very much a a hip hop enthusiast, right? You know, so a purist and it would be the same with the other guys. But then I heard that the guy who owns Twitter had um, basically NFT'd his first tweet. 
And so that, right. So, it, you know, so it's like, there we go again. It's a collector's item. So, I mean, I'm, but I'm, I'm just confused because it's not like that tweet doesn't exist in the world. So how do you own that? You know what I mean? Yeah, I see what you're saying. So to answer that question, I don't know if it was rhetorical, Bree. So please correct me (laughs) if I'm wrong. But I think what happens is that the NFT is coded and then minted. And when it's minted, it now belongs to, there's a serial number. And if it's sort of like when we go in and we master music, you know, if there's one master, but that master has maybe several versions. It's like, mm-hmm. here's the instrumental, here's the acapella, here's your show track, here's your remix track, whatever, whatever. And all of those belong to the mother, which is the master. And that's how I see the NFTs is if they say we're only minting a hundred, then it's like the versions of a master and they all have numbers and they're all, they've all been digitized and they they're all locked in and coded and it's crypto it's it's on the blockchain right i totally get that but i mean i'm not, the reason i'm having this conversation is cuz i know my audience is thinking the same thing like this seems a little insane so yeah i mean with art physical art i get it right it's a physical thing only one person can have the mona lisa in their in their home Correct. right or in their museum or whatever But with music, like that song, is that not still on streaming? So if if I own that song as an NFT, is can it also be streamed by the world? So how am I actually owning it? Or is it actually taken off the market? I think that and I may be wrong on this on this particular one, but I think that when the song is been created in an NFT, it has to be the one of its kind. Like Do you know what I'm saying? So if, for instance, if I'm taking a song from my first album, something about it has to be different, even though it's supposed to be from that first album, there has to be something that gives it a unique quality because otherwise it can't be quote unquote, a collector, a collector. Totally makes sense. So then my next question is, Say I own, let's say you did a gospel remix of some song that you have, right? Or whatever. Let's just say we called it that. And I now own it. Now, if I own it, do I have then the right to distribute it on Spotify and collect royalties for it because I own it? And so (laughs) I think that's a good question. No, that's a great question. I'm not expecting you to have the answers. I just thought it was interesting to have this conversation because these are all the questions that run around in my head when we talk about NFTs and like, I don't want musicians to like go, this is amazing. We should be doing this. And and when they don't really understand what's involved. Correct. No, absolutely. And you know, I, and so what someone was explaining to me, and that's a great question that you, the way you pose that is like, okay, yes. So I just bought it. Right. So I own it, but they were explaining to me that you do own it, but you own it, I guess, contingent upon however the distributor or the creator agreed, right? So it's like, so let's say you bought one from me, Brie. And then I said, okay, yes, you own this. Now you you own a percentage of it. So you will collect a percentage of it. You okay, so it. it's more like selling a percentage versus me owning it outright. Could be. I could, you know, it's kind of like, to me that that likens to like a contract, Right. So it's like you'll sign a a music contract and then but it's like, yeah, but for what? For how much of your publishing, for how many years, for what are the terms? What am I giving you up front? So the NFT is like that. Yes, that that does make sense. And I have also heard that, you know, there are versions where the artist like still retains a certain portion. And if I were I could resell that NFT to someone else. And when I do that, the artist gets some percentage of that sale. Correct. Very interesting. Yeah. And it all sounds cool and it sounds like awesome (laughs) for musicians, but it sounds so complicated. (laughs) I don't know that the average indie artist would figure it out. And it's also expensive because you have to mint it and everything. Yes. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You have to mint it. There are gas prices. There's a whole world. Mm -hmm. So just from what I know, the little that I've learned, and it's as you can see, it's been very little, but 
I just from what I've learned, it's it's quite expensive to even to mint an NFT. Yeah. You know, let alone to continue to do that. And it's expensive enough for us to manufacture our craft. That's true, you know, studio and all that. So are you generally just educating artists about this, but not really making any recommendations of like, oh, this is something you should look into or do? No. And you know what? I don't know if I could. (laughs) I don't know if I could be that disciplined. I think I'm I'm too passionate about it one way or the other. So I'd be hard pressed to say, but I, I will say this is my advice. You don't have to take it. But this is what I think the next move should be. But I'm also the one to say this is just based on my advice. Right. This is based on my history or, you know, maybe what I've been through. But I will always kind of like push a person to here's the subject matter expert, like go and get marketing help or go and get whatever it is that they need or your manager will speak to that or your lawyer will speak to that. So, yeah, that that makes sense because I I agree. Like, I don't ever want to steer an artist in a direction where I don't feel completely confident that I know what I'm telling them to do. So absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. In your work in the Friendship Society, do you help artists uh, get into the sync world? Cause I know you're pretty passionate about, about sync licensing. Mm-hmm. Wow. Do you direct them on how they can, um, you know, maybe make some sync deals or. I would say yes, but I would say no. Yes. I'm definitely going to d- direct them in the realm of just understanding what sync is and understanding here are some companies that I think you should look at. And based on where you are, I think sync would be a good thing. And, you know, if you have this much catalog, you know, thus and so. But definitely, I will always make sure that an artist knows these are all of the options laid out here for you. These are the these are all of the deals that you can get. This is all of the revenue that you should be looking at. Look at this, you know, sheet music. Look at this, you know, this is here we are concert here touring, you know, studio singing. This is all of. You can do all of these things. So So you do something pretty similar to what we do here at Profitable Musician. You know, we have our 39 little known uh, income streams for musicians. And I try to expose them to like anything that they're probably not tapping into right now. There you go. There you go. And that's why I was saying in the email, I don't know if you noted that, but I was like, uh, once I looked at you guys and I was, you know, remarking at, wow, this is great work you guys are doing. You know, we have similar um, objectives when it comes mm-hmm. to just wanting to, um, you know, see our our community progress, basically. That's what it is. Absolutely. So as far as sync, do you recommend, especially for legacy artists to do that because they have such a big catalog? Are you kidding? Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) They're the ones that are winning right now. Mm. Oh, I think it was Stranger Things. It was Kate. Oh, Oh, yes. Kate Bush. There you go. Yes. And so how about that? And then, you know, when I read the article, it was like, Okay, Kate Bush, this is her first number one. Wow. Like, wow. And even she was like, oh, my goodness. You know, but can you imagine the, you know, the money, the streams? Yep. Over 27 years from that song. I remember I was in high school when that song came out. You know, I remember that song. Really? What (laughs) in the world? And then there was another artist to follow. It was the same thing. I don't know if it was Stranger Things or not, but it's so it's like, oh, wow. So all of this music from the past now being used in, you know, licensing and sync and thus it's like it ups the streams, especially if it's a a show like that, you know, oh, yeah, that has such a huge following. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. When it comes to sync, do you recommend particular paths like, uh, you know, going for music libraries or reaching out to supervisors, or you just kind of expose them to every possibility? Every possibility. Yep. Because as you know, as you know, it wouldn't be a one size fit all. Right. And, and I always say start small, you know, and get a feel for it. I think between music licensing, it's the same like publishing deals or admin deals. 
it's this is a relationship. It's a dance that has to be done between you and the other person. And then before you know it, you can't cut the faucet off because they're mm-hmm. like, hey, this and hey, that. And hey, I got this movie. And hey, can you send me this? And now you're like, oh, boy, I <laughs> sent you everything I have. I actually, you know, will create. Some I need things. to write some more stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's a good problem to have. That so yeah, a good definitely. problem to have. Yeah. Definitely, 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 definitely. I definitely will refer them to music libraries that I know. And I also have a guy um, that I've dealt with who is really, really super busy in licensing and sync. So I always like to send people his way because I know that's his jam. That's what he does. So that's awesome. So you're just providing a ton of great resources for people. Yeah. I love hand um, I know you you talk a lot about uh, artists owning their story. What do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Well, a few things. So when we think about ownership, I think sometimes we just think that that means I just released it. But no, you really have to own it. It's like, here's a good example. I will never forget this. I had a property. I had brought this property. Um, I'm from Michigan. And my grandmother said, let me see the um, paperwork. Uh, I want to see the paperwork. And I, I gave her the paperwork. And she said, this is a quick claim deed. And I said, yes, yeah, my paperwork. She said, you don't own it. I said, yeah, this is it. She said, no. <laughs> Whoever quick claimed the house to you, <laughs> they're the person that they can decide they're going to take it back from you at any time. You know what I'm saying? So to me, it was like, that was a, a, an education to me about, oh, I should have the deed. I should have this. I should have that. It's much the same for music. Um, it's not like you just put it out there and then you own it. You don't have an ISRC code. You don't have the correct metadata. You don't have this. You don't have that. And then you, you uploaded it to, I don't know, United Masters. But United Masters provided the ISRC. They provided the UPC. So you don't think that United Masters is getting a piece of the royalty? In the metadata world, United Master has all the data to your song. I mean, you have the file cuts, sure. But, you know. (laughs) Yeah, nowadays, especially with blockchain and all that coming in, like uh, metadata is so important. It's a big thing. It's a big thing. And it's... And so when I talk to them about owning their story, owning their intellectual property, I'm just speaking of the whole lot, you know, not just the masters, not just the stems, everything. Yeah. I mean, that's so important. I was just talking to a a client earlier today, reminding Mm -hmm. her like, she's like, oh, I'm not working this one with this one producer anymore because I can't afford them. I switched to another one. I said, please tell me you have all your masters. (laughs) <laughs> like, please tell me. And she's like, I don't think I have my stems. I said, go get them, <laughs> go get them. Because yes, I mean, your relationship with this producer is not bad yet. But yes. if he gets annoyed that you're not working with him anymore, you know, he could hold that hostage. Absolutely. And so many people are just like, oh, you know, I can just get it from my producer whenever I want. No, you can't. Mm-hmm. I know people that like their producer, like had a hard drive fail and everything was gone. Like <laughs> you have to make sure to have your stuff. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because yeah, they'll, they'll say, Hey, it crashed. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Right. Do you recommend particular distributors that people use that, you know, you feel like are going to give them the most autonomy? No, 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 no. I always say, no, you have to do your, your homework. You know, Mm -hmm. here's a list. This is what I, this is where, you know, I know these people exist. But yeah, you have to do your homework. I have been asked. How, what I'm you sure artists from? ask that all the time because they're, <laughs> yeah. they're like, there's these 10 distributors. I don't know which one to pick. Right. And I get it. Like each one of them has a different, it depends on how often are you releasing, you know, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. all that, like the price or, you know, are you a publisher or not? You know, like it just, you know, there's so many things, so many different criteria Yeah, that you got to look at for yourself Yeah, between them. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I guess it depends also because sometimes I will hear maybe the person I'll never forget. I heard a person they were promoting. I won't say which platform it was, but there was a long interview and I just listened to the interview and I was like, this is so much crap. Like (laughs) 
<laughs> this is not good. You are not. That's not true. <laughs> so when I heard that, um, uh, there was a friend of mine. So in that sense, yeah, she's a friend of mine. She's like, yeah, I'm going to put the music out and I'm putting it out through, you know, X, Y, Z. And I was like, why? <laughs> no, don't. And um, don't, you know, several months later, this friend came to me and sh she said, um, I got to, you know, X, X amount of streams and something happened. There was a glitch in the matrix and all of my streams are gone. Mm. Yikes. What? What? Yeah. That is like, what just happened? Yeah. And I think, you know, you got to know that the distributor that you're with is there for the long term, because I've also heard of some people, it's like, I, I did it through this. And then they decided that they're not doing distribution anymore. And yeah. all my stuff just disappeared. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's crazy. <laughs> Wow. It's crazy. Oh my gosh. Well, um, is there anything else you want to tell listeners while we're here about what you guys do at the Friendship Society and, and anything else you want artists to know? Yes. So you can find me at the friendshipsociety.com and we are coaching. What we're doing is coaching. We've created a community. We're not marketing analysts um, and we're not managers, you know, um, but we are coaching, we're teaching you about the fundamentals of the, the business infrastructure of music and entertainment. And that is what we do. It, it may, you know, I don't know how um, exciting that sounds. Well, you know what I love about it is that you're, you're unbiased, like you're an unbiased advisor. Yeah. Because everybody else that's like, you know, going to be coming at them with, oh, you need this, you need that. Well, they're trying to sell them something, right? Yeah. You know, exactly. I want you to be my manager. I want you to be my lawyer. You know, I want you to use oh, this yeah. service, et cetera. Like having this unbiased person to just say like, here's the research I did. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Valuable. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. So look us up. Um, we're having some things coming down the the, the pipeline where we're, we're going to have a course on on revenue. We got tons of free resources, things as it pertains to TikTok, how to get your numbers up. All of that stuff is very easy. The algorithm, the this, the that. I've been through the gamut. So it's nothing I can talk to you about that and then refer you on to some great musicians um, and great organizations like female musicians. <laughs> That's great. I love it. And is it friendshipsociety.com? Yes. And are you yeah. guys on socials? Yes. Um, we're everything the Friendship Society except for Twitter. Uh, Twitter, we are TFS underscore ATL. Oh, that's a lovely one. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay. <laughs> so is it the Friendship Society? Everybody yeah. Else? Okay. Friendship Society. Yes. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank you so much. I, this has been a really great conversation and I challenged you with some things that I really wanted to know the answers to. And so we, you know, I think it was great to just kind of hash all that. This is how we think it is. You know, there's yeah. a lot of things that are changing all the time in the industry and all of us are learning. Yes. Yes. Well, no, thank you so much. As I said, it, it's a privilege. Once I did some digging on you, I was like, okay, she's a rock star. Aww, <laughs> so this is going to be great. No, anyone can, you know, accomplish what you have accomplished. And now you've managed to build this amazing community. There's something to be said about that, that this is no small feat. And now you guys have your own academy. So congratulations to you. And I'm honored that you would have me. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. 
And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.